Well, thank you all very much for coming along today to the third of my academic lectures this year on what may be the last day of summer or perhaps the first day of winter. And this year, I'm taking as my theme some examples of really fundamental concepts of mathematics and how they have evolved. And today, it's symmetry in groups. And groups are one of the most important structures in modern mathematics. And I hope by the end of this lecture that you'll be very familiar with them. Well, one of the most important patterns that a mathematician looks for is whether or not an object has symmetries. That is, is left unchanged or invariant after some operation. For example, reflection of a square or rotation of a square. The concept of a group of symmetries, the collection of symmetries that a body has, describes how much symmetry belongs to the object. And this concept of a group of symmetries is one of the most important in mathematics and also helps to describe and explain the modern world. Well, just as a number such as 145 measures quantity, that's the number of people there are in this lecture theatre at the moment, or a number such as root 2 measures magnitude, such as the length of a line, we can think of a group as measuring and quantifying symmetry. And mathematicians view the theory of groups as beautiful and significant. So let me give an overview of the lecture. I'm going to start with concrete examples. All my examples are going to be very concrete. <coughs> and the essence of a group is that it's a collection of objects, it's a collection of objects with some way of combining or composing two of them to get a third object. And the way of combi combining or composing them has got certain properties. And I'm going to illustrate this initially for the collection of symmetries of an equilateral triangle. And in particular, I will introduce what's called the Cayley table that shows how the objects are combined. And the Cayley table is named after the distinguished English mathematician Arthur Cayley. And then I will use the symmetries of an equilateral triangle to motivate the definition of an abstract group. I'll then go on, because it's really in the abstract of this talk, to compare the symmetries of a square and a rectangle. And we can work out what they are relatively quickly by, this, by that point in the talk. And I'll be able to show from the group of symmetries that the square is much more symmetric, as we all know, than a rectangle. I'll use that for an application to look at the symmetries, the group of symmetries of the platonic or the regular solids. And in particular, I'm going to see that some of these regular solids have got the same symmetry group, and we'll look for what is the underlying geometric reason. So I wanted to bring something in at this point that was an application <coughs> of what otherwise you might have thought was a lot of arid nonsense. Then I'll turn to the structure of groups. And we won't be able to go very far, naturally, but we'll get, reach the most important result of all, a result connecting subgroups. It's not hard to define a subgroup. It's just a little group inside a group. And the size of subgroups and the size of the group, and there's quite a lot of restrictions in those, and that's called Lagrange's theorem. Then we'll see an astounding example of that, of the um, application of Lagrange's theorem, which is called... Fermat's little theorem and number theory, and you can astound your fellow companions on your way home in the tube by challenging them for to this particular result, and I'll give you details of that <laughs> when we come to it. And that uses modular arithmetic, which is um, not looking at the integers, but looking at the remainders that you get when you divide by a certain integer. So 24-hour clock is a standard example. Uh, when you get round to 24, you go back to 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. And then all I'm going to be dealing with in this talk, all you have time to deal with in a talk, starting to introduce the subject to, you know, to non-specialists such as you know, many or most of you are, is to deal with finite groups that only have a finite number of elements, but there's a whole big area out there to do with infinite groups, groups that have got an infinite amount of, um, an infinite number of elements, and they have got particular application in mechanics, in um, geometry, topology. And then, um, well, that, that's the way that the uh, particles are defined in um, the standard model. Okay, so let me look and start off at the beginning. 
with an equilateral triangle. Okay. We take an equilateral triangle, take any one. Um, this is a particular one. And what we want to do is to count all the rigid motions that leave this triangle unchanged or invariant. So in a sense, what I want to do is to count the number of transformations, rigid motions, of this triangle so that if you were to look away and I were to do one, when you look back, nothing would have changed. That's what I mean by a rigid motion, leaving the shape invariant. Now, that would get tedious after a while. So we need to know what the actual transformation what is. So that's why I introduced labels. So we're going to be able to describe the different transformations that leave the triangle, which is the previous slide, leave that triangle the same. Right. So there's one. I'll introduce some of them. Um, there's the trivial one, the identity. Now, the identity seems very boring, but it turns out to be absolutely crucial to, to the notion of grip. The identity just means do nothing, so that when you look away, I don't do anything, and when you look back, clearly nothing has changed. Perhaps more interesting is the one that rotates the triangle 120, 120 degrees anti-clockwise. Uh, so there we see our triangle. It's rotated 120 degrees anti-clockwise about the centre, so vertex 1 if you look at the bottom of the slide, goes to the left-hand bottom vertex, uh, vertex 2 goes to the bottom right-hand vertex, and the bot vertex 3 goes to, to, to the top vertex. And we're going to give a name to this rotation. We're going to call it R for rotation. Then you could rotate by 240 degrees anti-clockwise. That's performing the rotation R followed by the rotation R. And we write that as R squared or to the power of 2. And you see what it does to the vertices of the equilateral triangle um, if you look along the bottom of the screen. So vertex 1 goes right round to the bottom right, and you can see 2 goes to the top and so on. But doing this, it's such fun, we'll do it again. So we'll follow by the rotation R again, and what do you see? The vertices 1, 2, 3 have returned to their original positions. So another way of putting that without all this group theory nonsense is that rotating by 360 degrees brings you back to where you are. But we do have some information in the way that we're presenting it. It means that R cubed is the identity. So we're already beginning to get some algebra coming in here. The operation R rotating by 120 degrees when cubed gives you back the identity. Now, in the same way that rotating anti-clockwise gives you symmetries of the equilateral triangle, so rotating clockwise would do the same. Clockwise by 120, clockwise by 240. And I'll come back to the, those in a moment. Because I want to use the operation of turning the triangle over. Or reflect, uh, reflection, which is the same. But I want to use T for turning over, so that I've got using a different letter. So T is the transformation that turns the triangle over, keeping the top vertex fixed. So if you look at it, down below in the lower half of the screen, the vertex 1, the top vertex remains the same, but the bottom left becomes the bottom right, and the bottom right becomes the bottom left. So we've got this operation T, and I'm sure you can think of other transformations that will leave the triangle fixed. For example, looking at the line from the bottom left vertex, through the centre of the triangle, turning it over about that line, or looking at the line through the bottom right triangle, uh, vertex of the triangle, and turning it over that. This is a crucial point. One symmetry transformation followed by another symmetry transformation is a symmetry transformation. Because if you think about it, what's a symmetry transformation? It's something that leaves the triangle invariant. So you do one of them, the triangle's left invariant. You do another one, the triangle's left invariant. So doing the two of them leaves the triangle invariant. That point is crucial to what comes on later, that when you compose two of them, you get another one of the same type. So let me just illustrate that here in the case of doing the rotation followed by the turning over. So first of all, I operate, and the way of writing it just classically is as T or. Or is the one you do first, T is the one you do next. So I do that rotation first of all, 
So we've got the rotation, as you saw it on an earlier slide. Uh, top goes down to the bottom left, bottom left to the bottom right, and bottom right up to the top again. Then you turn over about the top. So we see along the top of the slide here how the vertices change. And if you look at it, vertex 2 has remained where it was. And what has happened is that 3 and 1 have interchanged. So this is the operation which is turning over about the line through the bottom left vertex and up through the centre of the triangle. So we compose two vertices, a rotation and a turning over about the top one, and we get a turning over about the bottom left one. So two symmetries composed, giving another symmetry. But let's do them in the opposite order. Let's do the turning over first, followed by the rotation. And if you do the turning over first, followed by the rotation, again looking at the vertices, and you can see how much fun you're going to have doing this for yourself later on. <laughs> um, there is the turning over. The vertex 1 remains the same. The 2 and the 3 flip over. And then you do the rotation around. So the 1 comes down here, the 3 to there, and the 2 goes up to the top. And if you look at this and you say, what symmetry is that representing? Well, the 3, the bottom right vertex, had stayed what it, where it was, and the other 2 have turned over. So this is the symmetry operation of reflecting about the line or turning over about the line that goes from the three, from the bottom right vertex, through the centre of the triangle. So we have here that these composing of symmetry operations gives you other symmetry operations. But what we've noticed in this case is that TR, which is rotating followed by turning over, is not the same as RT, which is turning over followed by rotating. And I've just sort of spelt that out by taking the two diagrams on the previous slides and reproducing them here. So this is an example of a group which is said not to be commutative, and I'll, another word for that is not, abel is abel not abelian, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Fine. But first, we want to come to this. need to look back and see what I called the talk. Yes, I did, I hope. This isn't a talk about symmetry. This is a talk about symmetries. And that's important to remember. What we're doing is we're looking not at asymmetry of the equilateral triangle or of some other structure or some other object. We're looking at all the symmetries that object has. That's, that's core. And here... We've got the six symmetries of the equilateral triangle. We've got do nothing. Rotate 120 clockwise, anti-clockwise. Rotate 240 anti-clockwise. T, turn the triangle over, keeping the <coughs> line from the top vertex fixed. TR, turn the triangle over, keeping the line joining the bottom left vertex to the centre fixed. Or T, turn the triangle over, keeping the line joining the bottom right vertex to the triangle fixed. Now, you may remember... I mentioned you could also rotate clockwise as well as rotating anti-clockwise. But if you rotate clockwise by 120 degrees, it's the same as going anti-clockwise by 240 degrees. Going 120 round that way clockwise is the same as going 240 anti-clockwise. So in other words, rotating by 120 degrees clockwise is R squared. It's already in the list. Right? So the clockwise rotations are not different symmetries. They're already here. Okay. But just to convince you even further, you'll say to me, Raymond, you've been making a very big point that if you combine two symmetries, you always get a symmetry. Well, why not combine every one that you've got on this slide with every other one and see if you get anything new? And we do that. I've done it for you. <coughs> So this is the composition table for the symmetries of the equilateral triangle. We have got all the symmetries down on the left-hand side, and then we have them across the top. And then in the various entries in the table, what I'm going to do is write down the result of doing the first, that symmetry first of all, then followed by that symmetry is what gives you this entry in the table. This entry in the table 
is obtained by doing that symmetry first of all, followed by that symmetry. And I'm sure you're getting the pattern. Let's see, what about this one here? That entry is obtained by doing this symmetry first, followed by that symmetry up there. Now some of them, all of them, you can calculate by drawing your equilateral triangle, putting your little um, numbers on it, one, two, three, turning them over and rotating. And you'll be able to work out what all of these are. And crucially, first of all, you note that you've got nothing new. All the operations that appear in the table as a result of doing this first, followed by that, are one of the ones that we have before. So we have produced no new symmetries. And in fact, I say there are no other symmetries of the equilateral triangle. And secondly, we don't have to do it by writing down labels on the triangle. We can do it a little bit more in a sophisticated way because let's look at the red one. How do we calculate the red one? Well, what we have to do is to do R squared first, R squared first, and then we have to do TR. Then we have to do TR. So it's TR times R squared, which is TR cubed, which, remember, R cubed is the identity symmetry, which does nothing. The identity symmetry doing nothing, followed by T, is just T. So there are relations between the symmetries of the equilateral triangle that allow you to calculate what these, these particular things are. And, in fact, this table is an example of a Latin square um, because every element appears once and only once in every row and column. Um, definition. So every time that you have a Cayley table, a group table, you get for free a Latin square. <laughs> the converse isn't true. Not all Latin squares are Cayley tables. All right. So... Just to digress a little bit, why is it called the Cayley Table? It's called the ta Cayley Table after this man here, Arthur Cayley. And as frequently happens from an early age, Cayley developed a remarkable ability for mathematics. Uh, at the age of 14, he enrolled as a day pupil at King's College London and progressed from there to Trinity College Cambridge. And he had a glittering academic career, winning all the prizes in front of him, emerging top of his year. And, of course, he was awarded a fellowship at Trinity College. But in those days, college fellows had, were required to train for the priesthood, and Cayley had no wish to do so. So he left Trinity to go to Gray's Inn here in London, where he trained as a lawyer, became a barrister. And he spent 17 very successful years as a very successful barrister in London. And during that time, he wrote over 200 mathematical papers, including some of his most important contributions to the subject initiating the algebra of matrices, which you might have heard of, and invariant theory, which you probably haven't, which is the study of expressions left invariant under by certain transformations. But in 1863, Cambridge founded the Sadlerian Chair of Pure Mathematics, and that had no religious requirements. So Cayley was duly appointed, returned to his alma mater, and there he spent the rest of his life. He was one of the most prolific mathematicians of all time. He produced almost 1,000 research papers at a remarkable rate in a wide variety of topics. So the Cayley table is uh, the multiplication table for a group is, is named after him. So let's look at it again. All right. I'm going to introduce some definitions because they'll be important when we come to this um, Lagrange theorem about telling you how groups can be put together to some extent. And we have this definition that the order <coughs> of a symmetry um, is the number of times you have to compose it with itself to first of all get the identity. So if we look at the rotation R, it's going to be of order 3 because you have to compose it with itself three times to get first back to the identity. R times R times R is R cubed, and we saw that R cubed is the identity. R squared isn't, R cubed is the identity. Now if you look at R squared, it also is an element of order 3, because you go from R squared to R to the 4th to R to the 6th, and you get back to the identity. Remember, R cubed is the identity. And it has three elements of order 2. You can do that by just looking at the Cayley table, because if you want to find out what, let's say, RT is, Combined with RT, we go to the entry across here in that row and in that column, and we see the identity sitting there. 
But of course, you don't need any of this apparatus to do that because we know that RT is just turning something over. And if you turn something over twice, you get back to where you start. So you don't need this apparatus in order to do it. And there's one element of order one. So what I'm coming to now are really the most important slides of the lecture, the two most important ones, about the definition of a group. Okay. So we say that the symmetries of an equilateral triangle form a group. Now what does that mean? The essence of it is that you have a, a particular collection of objects, a particular set. Here they are, the symmetries of the equilateral triangle. And you've got a way of composing two of them together to end up getting another element of the set. We call that closed. You don't go outside the set, you remain within it. So you've got some way of combining, a rule for combining two elements that gives you back another element of the set. That combination operation has got particular properties. There's one of them, called the identity, which does nothing. When you combine it to, with any of the others, nothing happens. It leaves it alone. It leaves it unchanged. And then you can undo what you've done. If you perform any operation, any symmetry operation, there's another one that will allow you to combine both of them and you get back to the identity. So this identity is pretty crucial in all of it. And this definition took many decades to develop and I'm giving it to you in, in less than a minute. So um, you're be quite right to be asking you know, why this, why important, but that's what I hope to be able to convince you of by the end of the lecture. So a set, a collection of objects, a way of combining things together that doesn't take you outside the set, a symmetry that does nothing, and anything you do can be undone, and then there's a technical one at the end called um, the fact it's associative. It's because we're only talking about combining things in pairs. You want to make sure that if you combine them in pairs, in the two different ways you do it, you get the same result. So that's saying, if you want to work out what ABC is, if you do it by combining AB first of all, and then do that result with C, you get the same answer than if you combine BC, and um, that's combined with A, just as written down on the bottom. It's a, an important thing to have. It's really just to make an unambiguous sense of ABC, and I'm including it for completeness um, as much as anything else. Okay. so. Let me take you with the, the abstract idea of what a group is now, and then we'll look at various examples of them during, during the rest of the lecture, and look at some applications uh, as to why the idea is important. Okay. All right. So this is abstract, but not when you learn to read it correctly. What the header in blue is really saying is that you've got a set, a way of combining two elements in the set that gives you another element in the set. That's what the blue writing says. Right? And it's introduced a notation in order to be able to describe that. Then it says there's something that does nothing. And we give a name to it. We call it the identity. And that means if you combine the identity with anything else, the anything else remains unchanged. Thirdly, you can undo any action. So that if you take an element in the group G, you can find another element in the group H, so that when you combine the two together, you get the identity in whatever order you happen to do it. Okay. So no different from what we were talking about with the symmetries, but in a more abstract setting, and how modern mathematics develops is that there are lots of different sets upon which you can find or impose a group structure. And they give rise to lots of rich examples. That's how they tend to pop up everywhere and to be so important. And the associative law is that technical one I'd mentioned before. All right. Okay, let me turn to something I'm very proud of. I want to compare two groups of order six. And this is my drawing of six legs with six little feet at the end of them. Um, all equally spaced, the angles between them are all 60 degrees, so that if we look at the symmetry group of this um, particular geometrical object, we see that it has a rotation by 60, which leaves it unchanged. Um, we know the combining symmetries, 
gives a symmetry. So R squared will be a symmetry. So will R cubed. That's rotating by 180. R to the fourth, R to the five. But then when you do R to the six, you're back to the identity again. Because that's rotating by 360 degrees. Okay. So we've got two groups now with six elements. We've got equilateral triangle, the six elements, and we've got this one here. But they're very different groups, as you would expect, because the figures are very different. The reason I put the little feet onto the end of here is so that we have no turning over symmetry or reflecting symmetry, because if you turn it over, the little feet go in the opposite direction. They go the wrong way. So we've got no turning over symmetry here. We only have rotation symmetry. So we've got two groups now. The equilateral group, the symmetry group of the triangle, equilateral triangle, and this one here, they're different groups. Well, one way we could do it is we could just say, hey, hold on, there's a group of order six. In this one here, it's R. You have to combine R with itself six times to get back to the identity. And if you remember, there was no element like that in the symmetries of the equilateral triangle. What were there? There were two elements of order three, and three elements of order two. And here we have an element of order six. In fact, there are two elements of order six. There's R and there's R to the five are both of order six. So that's to show you that symmetry does in some sense capture the, um, what the object intrinsically is, um, but the two groups with the same order don't necessarily, aren't necessarily the same group. And I can do the Cayley group of order 6, and that's what it's like here with the same interpretation as before. And then we've got the point that I was making. It's got two elements of order 6, and it's got two elements of order 3. For example, take R squared. R squared times R squared times R squared is R to the 6, so it's back to itself. But unlike the equilateral triangle, the multiplication in this particular group is commutative. The order doesn't matter. Um, so that, if, for example, you were to take any two elements, for example, r squared multiplied by r cubed, which is r to the power of 5, that's the same answer as r cubed times r squared, uh, which is also r to the power of 5. So in this group, the order doesn't matter. And that's another <coughs> difference from the equilateral triangle where the order did matter. Rotating and reflecting is different from reflecting and then rotating. And these groups that commute are also called abelian groups, um, groups in which the order of combining does not matter. And this is uh, named after the Norwegian mathematician, Niels Henrik Abel. And this is a plaque of a house he lived in in Oslo. And let me translate the Norwegian for you. Uh, famous for his groundbreaking work on the theory of equations, infinite series, and elliptic functions, lived here 1815 to 1821. And here is his image on the tail plane of our Norwegian Airways plane. And I'm using this because I think it'd be quite nice to have British Airways put distinguished mathematicians on their tail plane, <laughs> or rather the portraits of distinguished mathematicians on their tail plane. Uh, but Abel had a rather tragic life. He grew up in Norway, desperate to study in the main centres, which at that time were uh, France and Germany, uh, eventually able to obtain a stipend that enabled him to spend time in Paris and Berlin. And in Germany, he did, did well. He met Leopold Krell. He published many papers in Krell's journal there. It was a new journal and became, helped to make it one of the most important mathematical journals in the 19th century. And in one of those papers, he showed the, uh, his result, the impossibility of solving the quintic equation using radicals, which was something I talked about last year. Uh, but the story of his attempts to be recognised and his lack of success in obtaining a mathematical position is a, is a sorry one. Um, many of his results appeared in what was called his Paris memoir, during the time, written during the time he spent in Paris. And that was lost for a while. When he returned to Norway, he contracted tuberculosis and he died at the early age of 26. And ironically, two days later, a letter, his memoir was found and uh, a letter offered him a prestigious professorship in Berlin. 
but he has been honoured by the international mathematical community. And um, background to this is that a special feature of the international congresses in mathematics held every four years, there's the award of Fields Medals to young mathematicians. And for many years, they were regarded as being the equivalent in mathematics to the Nobel Prizes. Um, but recently, a new prize, the Abel Prize, has been uh, created by the Norwegian Academy of Science. Um, it's, it's been instituted in 2002 to commemorate the bicentenary of Abel's birth. And it's presented annually by the King of Norway for outstanding scientific work in the field of mathematics. And um, the list of names of the people who have been awarded here is truly an out a list of the truly outstanding modern mathematicians. So what I want to do now is to sort of just do a couple, few more geometrical examples and then move on to numerical ones. And since I mentioned in the uh, abstract of the lecture about the symmetries of the square and the symmetries of the rectangle, let's just quickly look at those and see what they are. <coughs> Along the top, we have, looking from the left, I'll put the little blob there so that you can orient yourself. That's the identity. That does nothing. Then going along, you rotate by 90 degrees anti-clockwise, 180 anti-clockwise, 270 anti-clockwise, or as I prefer to say, to say to you now, this is going to be rotation by R, by R squared, by R cubed. Then on the bottom, we have the turning over or the reflections, reflections in the horizontal and vertical axis through the centre reflections in the two diagonals and you can see what happens there. These are all the symmetries that there are of the square. There are only eight symmetries of the square. If you do any two of them you'll get another symmetry but it'll be one of the eight that's on the screen you have in front of you. Okay. If you compare that to the symmetries of the rectangle we can see what happens is that we lose four of them. We only have the identity and one rotation now. I'll put the little red and green there so that you can see what's going on. This is the identity. That's our starting position. Here we rotate by 180. So we've only got a rectangle. I'm I know a square is technically a rectangle. I'm taking a rectangle with adjacent sides of different lengths um, in this example. So that we only have a rotation by 180. We don't have a rotation by 90 now. And also you... Um, turn about the vertical axis, V, and you've got um, uh, turning about the horizontal axis here. So we only have the four operations of the uh, <coughs> rectangle compared to the eight operations of the square. And that is the difference in the two symmetry groups. And in fact, if you look at the symmetry group of the rectangle, um, which I've written down there, again, that's just to show you that you don't get any new symmetries when you do it, but it's also an abelian group. Um, the order in which you combine any two elements doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, v times H is the same as H times uh, V. Or another way of thinking about it, it's symmetric about the leading diagonal going down here. If you look at the symmetry of it, it looks the same going on those things at the right angle. Okay. So that's quantifying, that's measuring completely all the symmetries that we have of the square. And I want to use that material that we've done, I think, to show something that really is quite pretty. And it's about the symmetry groups of the five regular, the five platonic solids, um, and uh, the tetrahedron. Uh, so with the regular solids, all their faces look the same. And when they come together at a vertex, all the vertices look the same as well. They're all regular, the same face for each of them. Sorry, all, all, within a particular one, they all have faces which are the same. And within a particular one, at any vertex, all the vertices look at the same. So the, the tetrahedron there, four faces, each an equilateral triangle. Cube, six faces, each a square. Octahedron, eight faces, each an equilateral triangle. And dodecahedron, 12 faces, each a regular pentagon and the icosahedron, 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. Okay. And in my lecture in January, um, I hope using Euler's formula to indicate how to show that these are the only five regular solids. Okay. So let me tell you how to calculate the symmetries of them. Let's start with the tetrahedron. 
So you take your tetrahedron and you choose one face as a, as a reference face. And what you can do is you can rotate every other face to become to that reference face. And since there are four faces, leaving things alone is one of them, since there are four faces, there are four ways of doing that. So you can <coughs> rotate the tetrahedron to get um, each of those four faces to be the one that you've chosen to be the reference face. Then, once you've got that as the reference face, that's an equilateral triangle. But we know how many symmetries there are for an equilateral triangle. You, must, you might be having nightmares about it, I've said it so often. There are six of them. Four ways of rotating to get to the reference face. Six symmetries of the, um, the reference face once you get there. Four times six is 24. So the size of the symmetry group of the tetrahedron is going to be four times six, 24. Well, let's do the cube. We can do it together. You've got six faces in the cube. One of them you choose as a reference face. So there are six ways of rotating the cube to get that, uh, get every other face to be uh, coincident with the reference face. Then again, we've just done it. We know the symmetries of the square, <coughs> which is the face, and the number of symmetries of the square is eight. So you get six times eight, which is 48. So the size of the symmetry group of the cube is 48. And I've done it for all of them here. The answer turns out to be two times the number of faces times the number of edges. So the number of symmetries down the right-hand column is 2e times f. And the argument is just the same as we've been doing before and before. You've got uh, f ways of moving the faces around to the reference one. And then once you get there, there are 2e symmetries of the uh, reference face. Now, what you get when you look at this is you see that the cube and the octahedron have got the same, have got, uh, their group of symmetries has got the same size, the same number of elements. And um, similarly for the dodecahedron and icosahedron. Now we know having the same size doesn't mean they're identical, but it turns out in this case that there actually are. If you were to write down the Cayley table for the cube and the Cayley table for the octahedron, there's a way of pairing off the elements in the Cayley tables so that when you pair off the symmetries of the cube with the symmetries of the octahedron, <coughs> it turns the Cayley table of the cube into the Cayley table of the octahedron. And we say in that case that the groups are isomorphic. So why is it that the symmetry groups of the cube and the octahedron are the same? Well, the reason is that beside, inside every cube, there's an octahedron. You take the centre of each face of the cube and you join them up and what you have inside that cube is this octahedron and any symmetry of the cube is going to leave this octahedron invariant as well so every symmetry <laughs> of the cube is the symmetry of the octahedron but it gets better inside every octahedron there's a cube you take the centre of each face of the octahedron and you join them all up and you get the cube. So every symmetry of the octahedron is going to give you a symmetry of the cube. And exactly the same thing applies doing this. Uh, we say that the octahedron and the cube are dual. They're dual polyhedra. D-U-A-L. Um, exactly the same thing holds for the um, dodecahedron and icosahedron. Um, if you take the centres of one of them and join them up, you get the other one, uh, you know, and, vi and vice versa. So what about the poor tetrahedron? Well, the poor tetrahedron turns out to be self-dual. If you take the tetrahedron and you join up the opposite, uh, sorry, you take the centres of each face and then join them together, you just get another little tetrahedron. <coughs> okay, so I wanted to put in at that stage something that, you know, was quite fitting. <coughs> And you can, of course, you can, do, you can keep going down. You can do that inside that and keep on going. Uh, there you are. Right. So let's come and see. Can we say anything about uh, how groups are made up? So we've got a subgroup. Have to put it down a definition, but it's just a little group inside a big group. And here I've got an example of it. This is, again, symmetry group of the equilateral triangle. And I've taken a subset of the three elements, I, R, and R squared. And if it's going to be a group in its own sense, of course it has to have the identity. If you combine two of them together, 
the ones in red are the subgroup. If you combine two of them together, you get another one of them, and that's the case. R times R squared gives you the identity, you know. And the other thing that you have to have is that there's an inverse for everything, so that you can undo the effect of one of them. How do you undo the effect of the effect of doing R? Well, you do R squared. So it's just a little group inside the big group. And here's another example um, where, again, this group has only got two elements, I and T, the ones in red. And that's because, well, the only thing you can do is do T followed by T. And since T is a turning over, it's just the identity. So subgroup is just a little group inside the big group. And the theorem of Lagrange tells you that, the, well, we just introduced one definition. Right? The order of a group is just its size. It's the number of elements that's in it. Right? Just sort of so you're getting into the, the notation. And what Lagrange's theorem, so symmetry group of the equilateral triangle, you know, is of order six. And Lagrange's theorem says the order of a subgroup divides the order of a group, or is a factor of the order of a group. So, for example, the group of symmetries of the equilateral triangle has order six, and the subgroups that I showed you, one of them had order three, three divides into six, and the one of them, IT, has order two, and two divides into six. Right. Now, the proof of that isn't, isn't too hard. It just shows you that a subgroup allows you to divide the, the group into so many sets of the same size. That's how you, you do it. So all we want here is that the order of a subgroup divides the order of the group. And I'm going to get a couple of consequences of that coming up here now. And there are two consequences. This is the first one. If you take an element and you keep multiplying it by itself, you're going to get back to the identity. We've seen that with rotations and we've seen that with reflections. But it happens in general. If you take an element, you're going to get back to the, the identity. If you take that little set, it, in fact, is a subgroup. Because just look at it, you know, it's g, it's g squared, g cubed, g to the fourth, g to the fifth, and so on, back to the identity. If you multiply any two of them, you get another one of them. You know, g to the four times g to the three is g to the seven. And there's an inverse for every one of them in there, so it's a little group. So that means its order, the order of the element g, that also has to divide the order of the group. All right, so let's, if you've got a, a group... So if you've got a group, yeah, and you take an element in it, if you keep combining with itself, you're going to get back to the identity. That collection of elements forms a subset, and we know that the number of them must divide the size of the group. That's what Lagrange's theorem said. Okay. And let me do the other consequence, and then we'll look at the examples, which I hope will try to um, make this more concrete. So all we're doing here now is we've got this restriction, so let's look at this now in a group it turns out because of Lagrange's theorem that any element combined with itself and um, that symbol there just means the, the size of G this is just the number of elements in the group so an equilateral triangle that's six the symmetries of the equilateral triangle and what this is saying is if you take any group and you take any element in it, and you combine that element with itself, you'll always get back to the identity. Okay, and I could have gone straight here if I wanted to, which is where you can jump to if you want. So suppose the order of the group is 12, and the order of the element is 4. Then if you combine G with itself 4 times, you get the identity. So combined with itself 12 times will also give the identity. So... Until you have a chance to sort of look back on this and uh, perhaps get a chance to reflect on it, just sort of hold on to that at the moment. It's saying that if you have discovered or divined or been handed a group, a finite group, then you know that if you take any element in it and compose it with itself, the number of times, which is the size of the group, you get the identity. That's for any element in the group. Okay, that, that, hold on to that. I could have recast that as a sort of you know, pseudo um, Lagrange theorem. Okay. Now that's what's going to make the idea of a group so powerful because if you can find one of them, you can say this about every element in it. Let me show you. If you just hold on how powerful that is. First of all, I'll just to introduce it gently, introduce the idea of remainders or of modular arithmetic. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take some integer 
for example, 24, the 24 hour clock is a, a classic example. And we look at the remainders that you can get by dividing by 24. In that case, I've listed them all down towards the bottom of the slide, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 23. And for an integer n, it would be 0, 1, 2, right up as far as n minus 1. They're all the answers you get when you divide by n. And the operation, how are you going to combine two of these remainders together? You're just going to add them normally, but take the answer, divide by 24, and write down the remainder. It's called modular arithmetic. You, you're only dealing with the remainder. So there are some examples. Seven combined of using that um, little symbol for plus for the combination because it's just to remind us that when we add them together, then we take the remainder by dividing by 24. So 7 combined with 21. 7 added on to 21 is 28. But what's the remainder of 28 when you divide by 24? It's 4. Or another way of saying it, 21 hours after 7 o'clock is 4 o'clock. Here you take 15, add it on to 10. 15 and 10 is 25. What's the remainder of 25 when you divide by 24? The answer is 1. Um, the identity of the group is zero because if uh, you add zero onto anything, you leave it unchanged. And that's what identities do. Identities do nothing. And the inverse, they all have to have inverses. Well, the inverse of seven is 17 because seven and 17 is 24 and the remainder of dividing 24 by 24 is zero. <coughs> and the remainder of three would be 21. And you can... Do some for yourself. Okay. All right. But there's another operation that the integers have. And that operation is that you can multiply them together. Um, yes, no, I just want to say one of the reasons I introduced this is that these examples for every integer n, they're, they're all abelian, they're all commutative groups. And what you can in fact show is that every um, finite commutative, every finite abelian group can be made up of groups of this type. So they're an important category of groups because they allow you to um, build up every finite abelian group. Okay, so let's look, and this is the one that's going to enable us to show Fermat's little theorem. We're going to look at the remainders dividing by p, but we're going to look at the non zero ones. Um, and the reason we're looking at the non-zero ones is because we're going to multiply. And zero doesn't help us in this argument. So the group operation is we're going to multiply, but again we're taking the remainder after dividing by p. And we take p to be a prime. So for example, with p equal to 7, what are the remainders? The remainders are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. The group operation is to multiply 2 together, divide by 7 and get the remainder. So that 2 times 5 is 10. What's the remainder of 10 when you divide by 7? is 3. 4 times 4 is 16. What's the remainder of 16 when you divide by 7? is 2. The identity is 1. If you multiply by 1, you leave the thing that you multiplied by unchanged. Let's find out what the inverse of 2 is. Well, what we're looking for is we want to, want to multiply 2 by something that will give us 1. And the answer is 4, because 2 times 4 gives you 8. Divide 8 by 7, and the remainder is 1. Right. The inverse of 3 is 5, because 3 fives are 15. Divide 7 into 15, and you get 1 as the remainder. Of 6 is 6. 6 6 is 36 divided by 7 gives you a remainder of 1. Okay. Now, do you remember what I said a few slides back? That if you have a group, then, and if you take any element in it, and you raise it to the power of the number of elements in the group, you get the identity. So, this, that result tells you the following pick any prime p. Everybody picks 17. <laughs> Pick any integer less than that. 10. Then 10 is a member 
of the group of integers that I've just described for the prime 17. Is that right? You pick a prime, 17. Any integer smaller than it, 10. 10 belongs to the group of uh, integers less than n under multiplication. Okay. So that means, by the big result that I was pushing earlier on, that 10 to the power of 17 must be the identity, which means that 10 to the power of 17... Sorry, um, what are the number of elements in the group? The number of elements in the group is 17 minus 1, isn't it? It's 16. Because you look at all the integers less than p, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to p minus 1. Right? So that means 10 to the power of 17 minus 1 is 10 to the 16. Must be the identity. What does the identity mean? It means leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 17. If you take 10 to the 16, which is 1 followed by 16 zeros, and you divide by 17, the remainder is 1. What if you take 9 to the power of 16 and divide by 17? What's the answer going to be? Well, 9 is just another member of the group. A member of the group raised to the size of the group 16 divided by 17 is going to give you 1. It's so remarkable that I actually did the calculations by doing the divisions. 8 to the power of 16. Divide by 17, the remainder is 1. All right. I think it's astounding. Another prime, please. This is where you may embarrass yourself badly when you pick something that isn't a prime. Uh, 97 is prime, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, isn't it? All right. So, how many embers are going to be in the group? There's going to be 96. There's one left. You take any number, less than so, what's your favourite number? 52. 52 to the power of 96, when divided by 97, leaves a remainder of 1. 13 to the power of 96, when divided by 97, leaves a remainder of 1. Find another prime. Take p minus 1. Take any inch or less than it. Raise it up to that part. It's going to be 1. This is for a whole raft of primes, for a whole raft of integers, and how did it come about? If you were to try to prove that from first principles, I think you would sit down and scratch your head for a little while. <laughs> what we have got here, and how we proved it, was because we found something that was a group. It was the remainders on dividing by p. We were able to show that those remainders on dividing by p were a group. And we know that if they are a group, if you take any element and operate it on itself, the number of times which is the size of the group, you get back to the identity. So it was, in a sense, being able to define that structure, to be able to associate a group and whatever to it. And you get all of these results coming out for a large class of numbers and a large class of primes. And that's Fermat's little theorem, uh, called little theorem to contrast with Fermat's last theorem. It's usually stated in the way down at the bottom there, but I think that's a much, much nicer way of being able to do it. OK, just to finish then. All right, I want to... Now, public key cryptography seems quite mysterious, but it's just an application of another group idea. And I just want two minutes to tell you that it's in the notes, it'll be in the handout that you'll get. We had to take a prime the last time because of various reasons. The, the reason it had to be a prime was that um, uh, otherwise, you, you can, if it wasn't a prime, you could multiply numbers together and get, get zero. But, here, what we do is we take any, an integer n, in fact, it's, it's a product of two primes, five and seven, and we look at all, maybe ask you to cast your mind back a long way, all the integers that are relatively prime to 35. Now, relatively prime to means they've got no primes in common. <coughs> so that um, two, three, four, six, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, none of these numbers along here have got a prime in common with 35. 
right, with either five or seven. And it turns out, if you think about it, if I say it in words, you'll say yes. If I take two numbers that are relatively prime to n and multiply them together, you must be able to say with the answer, it's still relatively prime to n. Because if neither of them had a factor in common with n, multiplying them together, they're not going to have a factor in common with n. But you're getting excited now, because you think, that's going to be a group, it could be a group. It's closed. It's an operation that is closed. I do it, and I get one of the set. And when you check it through, it is. It has to have an identity. The identity is our old friend one, and you can go through it and check that each of those um, gives you a... I'm uh, sorry, that each element in that there has an inverse. Okay, now, what happens... And then again, we've got this result that... Um, what you're able to do, the order of this group, if you count those elements, it's 24. So that means that any one of these raised to the power of 24 gives you back the identity. Right? That's what the theorem said earlier on. Any one of these numbers here, raised to the power of 24, when divided by 35, gives you back the identity. And that's exactly what is happening, as you'll see in the slide when you have a chance to look at it. What you do for public key cryptography is you choose two big large <coughs> primes, multiply them together um, and publish this number n. And the secrecy hides upon the fact that it's very hard to find the prime factors of things. Also you find two numbers that when multiplied together have a remainder of 1 when you divide by 24. And when you put that all together when you have a chance, but it's using this result down here because here you have the message is just a number being raised to a power of 24, so it gives you back the identity, and um, that's where it all lies upon. So, to just bring it back to, whoops, it's that one there. Public key cryptography, when you have a chance to look at it, just is using this idea here. The message is divided into blocks, and the blocks are so, um, um, then they're encoded using numbers, and all we're saying here is we're using the fact we, cr we create a little group, or a big group actually, um, of all the numbers that are relatively primed to things, and then you're able to be able to use this result that when you combine something, when you raise it <coughs> to its own power, it gets you back to where you were. All right, so that essentially the end, except just a couple of concluding remarks, and before that, just to say to you is that, that what you're really finding is something here that if you can identify a structure in many different settings, then this structure of a group allows you to use general results to obtain lots of very particular examples. That, that's the power of it. That, that's the power of the abstraction. Um, and that's why people, for example, um, introduce groups to find them, because they then know they've got a whole raft of machinery that they can apply to it. And what I've been trying to show you is just one or two examples, and it, it's very hard on you, I've been very hard on you, have been very good, you're still here, um, <laughs> is to show you one or two of those examples that when you get a chance to look back on, you can see that once you have this thing, you get a lot of things coming out of it for relatively little work once you've set up the framework. Okay. Well, I didn't have any chance to introduce infinite groups, as you thankfully. Um, <laughs> but if you were to, you know, they're easy to think of. If you think of rotations of a circle about its centre, you can rotate a circle about its centre by any angle, and you still get a symmetry of the circle. You know, so there are lots of infinite groups around. If you take all of the integers under addition, that again forms a group because um, it's closed. Um, any two integers add it gives you an integer. There is an identity which is zero, and um, there are inverses there too. All right. And these infinite groups are also crucially important. Much of modern um, science and mathematics is couched in terms of them. Uh, it's in use within mathematics itself and geometry topology. A um, particularly nice example is in mechanics. They're, they're described by certain equations, and these equations have got certain <coughs> symmetries to them. So these now are equations of symmetries, not equations of a shape. But what do those equations, what do the symmetries of those equations relate to? Well, if you've got a certain kind of symmetry, you get conservation of energy. A certain kind of symmetry relates to conservation of angular momentum. So there's a mapping.
between the two kinds of things. And then, if you go to look at these Higgs boson or quarks or whatever, all these elementary particles, essentially what they're doing is they're relating to particular groups and particular representation of groups that you have within the, the standard model for particle physics. So I'm really trying to say to you that it's the language within <coughs> which um, so much of science and so much of mathematics is expressed. So it is, I, th I felt worth sharing with you. So anyway, thank you. You're the first people to whom I'm going to say have a Merry Christmas. Um, I hope you have lots of group activities. And I hope to see you in January for Surfaces Anthropology. Thank you. <laughs>